Greetings all and welcome to Dave's Craft Room. And on today's video, I have here my iPad, which contains this pattern, Maple and Eucalyptus by Gnome Angel and Karen Brown. And this is the pattern that we're going to use for this year's 100 Days, 100 Blocks challenge, challenge, which obviously I am participating in. I participated last year as well, and I made that quilt from the pattern called, um, I forget, wait, I have it here, Kinship. Last year I had the pattern printed so that it would look so chic and quiche. This year I just have it on the iPad cause that's easy enough and I can draw on it too. Why is this pattern a good pattern? The reason is when I first looked at it, I didn't realize that this was the case until I read it. The blocks are actually different sizes and then you can put coping strips or sashing to make them all the same size. Like that's what they did on the cover image, or you can lay them out however you want. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to come up with my own layout and do something different because I like to do that. But last year's quilt, I call that quilt take from the past. Don't let the past take from you. I wanted each block to be a work of art and tell a story. And I want that for this year's quilt too. But it also occurred to me that I want the whole quilt to tell a story from day one to day 100 doesn't necessarily need to be in any order. I just wanted to tell a story. So I realized first that I need a character. So I'm going to use this cat fabric right here. This is a cat fabric. Cream gray. I also have other colors as well. Any fabric I can use that's like a black cat with like a white Face. So I have a character. I haven't thought of his or her or their name yet, but the way I'm going to write my story is basically you put the character against some type of object, something to interact with, a setting or something, and then you make the character interact with that setting, and that's your story. So right now it's just a skeleton, but my idea is we have this alien from outer space. And what those aliens do is they come to planets and they implant into like an unborn creature and then they get born on our planet and then they take over the world. So the character is basically an alien from another planet, probably from planet Glamtron, who has come to take over the world and has succeeded. So what I have to do to make my story work is each block needs to have something that my character can interact with. And then the story just writes itself. So I need to do this a hundred times. Some of the blocks I will sew coping strips onto or sashing and some I will not. I will assemble it all at the end. And I'm going to probably applique my hat to each block. So let's start. Let's make block number one. Oh, there's a bonus layout. I forgot about the bonus layout. So this quilt comes with the bonus expansion pack option, which I surely did download. It's called Bonkers. And we are bonkers at Dave's craft room. So I almost feel like I have no choice other than to make the bonkers quilt. And all you do is make multiple of your quilt blocks. Oh man, that's a lot of work. There's like 500 blocks. There's 503 blocks in this. This quilt is so epic though. I almost feel like I can't not do it. Well, I'm not filming a new intro, so you might see a new <laughs> a recycled intro. So let's get started. Um, I guess I'm filming two videos at a time because I'm making bonkers and I'm making the regular one, but uh, we're gonna do that. <laughs> okay, construction details. So there's nothing to it but to do it. Okay, so this is block number one. So I'm gonna make a block, right? This, I, I'm looking at a lot of words right here. Show me pictures. So I'm just going to make the block, follow the block instructions. I'm not going to follow the frame instructions because my frames will be different. And then on the blockers one, they won't, they don't, those don't get framed at all. <laughs> Do you know what this blue is from? This blue is from one of my early videos, that um, denim and bias tape. That quote was called February Get Ink. 
You may notice a brand new sign behind me. Thank you to HDJ Signs for making that sign and my friend Abby who designed the logo in the first place. I absolutely love the logo and the sign is, oh, the sign is looking beautiful. On each day of this challenge, I posted the next block in the series on Instagram with a caption underneath that fleshed out the story of my character. In this video, I will tell the story of the quilt. You'll see the montage of the quilt blocks being made, but there won't be a lot of explanation as to how to make the blocks. That information is all in the pattern. And also, just know that I've had to condense the story down to fit it in a video. To read the full story behind every single block, you'll have to go to my Instagram page, which is linked below, and you can find all 100 blocks. Uh, I was meant to cut them to, I thought the finished size was two inches. The finished size is one and a half inches, so I have to trim these. Wrong. My name is 17 Sandra Devereaux Dupree, New Mexico 6000 Junior the 3rd, 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, and 9th. And as you can see, I'm on my 9th life, but only in this body. I come from a race of creatures called Gorfuls from the planet Glamtron. We have the power to travel through time and space in a non-corporeal state and take over the body of an unborn creature of our choosing. I wanted to rule the planet. So, an earthbound house cat was an obvious choice. As I'm now in my ninth and final life on this planet, I wish to take this opportunity to tell my story one chapter at a time for 100 days. My tale contains many contradictions, fabrications, exaggerations, and it comes in many different versions, and all are true. During my first life on Earth, I developed a penchant for glamping. Glamping involves nature-adjacent activities in a climate-controlled and designer-outfitted bungalow. After I took over the world, I was invited to go glamping with Michelle and Barack Obama in Maryland in 2012. I think Michelle was serving in a senior managerial role in one of the human settlements, and then Barack was her husband. They were great hosts. They put me up in a caravan that was so chic and quiche. They were tolerable glamping companions. But when they started asking me about extraterrestrial life, I somehow felt like I had been invited under false pretenses. I felt no need to hide anything, although I don't know why they were so interested. Glamtron is not a threat to anyone, and it's not susceptible to any threats from Earth either. They invited me glamping a second time, but it was the same night as Britney Spears' wedding, so I had to cancel on them. In my second life, I completed my military service. Just like Prince Harry and other members of the royal family, it's important for sovereigns to serve the people who serve them. I was a Master Chief Command Sergeant Fulbright Colonel of a platoon squadron unit. My duties included catching mice, bugs, and other small animals, eating the Cheez-Its that my squad mates gave me, letting them pet me to lift their morale, and patrolling the barracks for ghosts. I caught several ghosts. I retired after fulfilling my duties and I enjoyed a pension which included Cheez-Its and health insurance for the remainder of that life. In my childhood on Glamtron, we used to go on vacation to Glamtron's second largest moon, Irene. 
Glamtron has three moons, Curtis, Irene, and on Wednesdays we wear pink. The citizens of Glamtron often travel to our moons for vacations. We all travel non-corporeally, it's much more comfortable that way. But the wealthy can have their bodies sent to meet them at their destinations. The modest either stay non-corporeal, which makes it hard to sunbathe, or they rent avatar bodies to live in for the week. It works well, but sometimes people forget what their loved ones look like. The moon Curtis is for nightlife. I visited when I was young, but I no longer vibe with that energy. Irene is for the serene nature. I have many fond memories of hiking on the Plaid Mountains, climbing the corduroy trees, chillaxing on the paisley beaches, and basking in the hound's tooth sun. The gingham was so delicious. And on the moon on Wednesdays we wear pink, on Wednesdays they wear pink. My childhood on Glamtron represents much simpler times, but I understand why I chose complexity. If you would have told me back then that I would soon spend almost nine lives ruling over the planet Earth in the body of a house cat, I would not have been surprised at all. Maybe I didn't know the specific details, but I always knew just exactly what I was doing. In my third life, I made friends with a raccoon named Bethany Jackson. We met when we were both signed up for helicopter lessons in Calabasas. Bethany was a raccoon optometrist from Rancho Cucamonga. He inspired me to finally get my conjunctivitis taken care of. On that trip, I learned that raccoons, just like cats, also always land on their feet. But don't ask me how I know that. What happens during helicopter lessons in Calabasas stays in helicopter lessons in Calabasas. Bethany had two reasons for taking helicopter lessons. First, he wanted to be first on the scene when eyeballs could be picked up and transported for transplant into his patients. And second, so he could make some money giving helicopter tours of the Pennsylvania Grand Canyon. Fun fact, both raccoons and cats can survive a fall into the Pennsylvania Grand Canyon. That's not true for the regular Grand Canyon. But don't ask me how I know that. What happens on Bethany's helicopter tours of the Pennsylvania Grand Canyon stays on Bethany's helicopter tours of the Pennsylvania Grand Canyon. I used to own a fast food chain called McWhisker Burger. Our mascot is a cat that flies around on his skateboard called Meat Cat. I played Meat Cat in a few TV commercials. I still remember all my lines. Welcome to McWhisker Burger, home of the McWhisker Burger. May I take your order? McWhisker Burger was a huge success, but I got bored of being a fast food CEO in 2005 and I sold it to Garfield. He believed that McLasagna was a good idea. I tried to talk him out of it, but he wouldn't listen. He ran Nick Whiskerberger into the ground. I spent my fourth life in the wild, wild west. The year was 1887, and I'd heard rumor from some local alfalfa desperado that my former deputy turned dirty outlaw on the run, Nine Lives Clyde, was seen scratching on table legs in a saloon in a small mining town in New Mexico. Years prior when I was sheriff, Nine Lives Clyde had been my deputy. We were a good team. We'd taken down a group of rail car robbers and confiscated their stolen booty. But power corrupted Nine Lives. Sooner than I had the chance to return the stolen booty to its rightful owner, I discovered that Nine Lives had snatched it up and absquatulated West with the mayor's cat. I was the one who vouched for Clyde in the first place, and that double cross cost me everything. I had no choice other than to resign my post. I was poor as a church mouse, popular as a wet dog at a parlor social, and thin enough to take a bath in a shotgun barrel. But if I could bring Nine Lives to justice, I could redeem myself and resume my work as sheriff. I hopped on my horse graham cracker and rode into the sunset. Oh, this was meant to be HST. I'm piecing it the hard way. Whatever. After a long journey on horseback, I found Nine Lives Clyde grooming his whiskers, painting his tonsils and airing out his lungs to some yaks in that same saloon I'd heard about. Scratches all over every table leg in the joint. Boy was his face cracked to see me. I sobered him up and told him to explain himself. He told me that he didn't have a choice but to take the gold and run. Neither the mayor nor the town folk would accept his relationship with another tomcat. So he hatched a scheme to get a little nest egg, 
get his time and take French leave. He figured it was a victimless crime and he could build a new life further west, far from the judgmental eyes of townies and the law. But things didn't go to plan because the assayer declared the gold counterfeit. Poverty and stress drove Nine Lives to drink and drove away his tongue. I had to interrupt Nine Lives. Wait a minute, the gold was fake? That's right, gold-plated brass, every ounce. So the real criminals were not the robbers who stole it, but the counterfeiters that made it. And Nine Lives Clyde, he may have had ill intentions, but he didn't actually take anything of value. I let Clyde off the hook. Told him to clean up his act, quit the drink, and earn an honest living so he could win back his Tomcat. Everybody deserves a second chance in life, and I had a new mission. Go back home, investigate and catch those counterfeiters, talk some sense into the mayor, and find my own version of redemption. I am allergic to strawberries. Years ago, I demanded that Dr. Biden ban Alice in Wonderland from her English class because of the harmful stereotyped portrayal of the Cheshire Cat. She refused to do so and she's had it out for me ever since. Last year, right before I was about to deliver the State of the Universe address to be broadcast across the planet, Dr. Biden gave me a slice of strawberry and basil balsamic pizza. I ate it not knowing what it was and I had a reaction and had to be rushed to the veterinary general's office. My State of the Universe address was ruined. Everyone thinks that Dr. Biden is so nice because she teaches English and she's so charming at luncheons. But I'll never forget strawberry and basil balsamic pizza gate. In my fifth life, I had a brief but troubling obsession with yoga. It started when I joined a yoga class on Monsdays and Thursdays at 27 o'clock. My top three favorite positions were Warrior 1, Warrior 2, and Warrior 3. I can do all the way up to Warrior 7. I eventually graduated to being a yoga instructor and I gained my own cult following in Fairbanks, Alaska, until the papers revealed my yoga group for the money-making Ponzi scheme that it was all along. I can still remember the headlines. Fairbanks flexible feline flat out fails. In one of my previous lives, I forget which, I was walking near an old park outside an elementary school. There used to be an elementary school near my house. It is not there now. As I was walking, I spotted a pinwheel sticking up out of the ground. One of the school children must have left it there. I spun the pinwheel as fast as I could. For some reason, I found it so amusing. I spun it faster and faster and faster until it broke the sound barrier. And pretty soon, it was spinning faster than the speed of light. What happens when you spin a pinwheel faster than the speed of light? Time starts moving in reverse. In my sixth life, I became a famous actor. My career started when I was scouted by a talent agent in a cat park in Carmel by the Sea. I was cast to play Catzilla in 1947's Catzilla and all eight of its sequels. This is the plot of Catzilla. One day, when a group of Finnish scientists was mining for neon in a crust under the Atlantic Ocean, an earthquake struck and shook their mining boats. It was soon discovered that they had opened up a crack in the Earth's crust which caused a huge earthquake. In the chaotic aftermath, a huge vat of neon gas leaked into the crack and came in contact with the remains of a prehistoric creature. The creature was Catzilla, ancestor to all Earth cats. Neon, whose atomic number is 10, had a special effect on the remains of Catzilla. Where his original series of mods ended at 9, the properties of the noble gas gave him a 10th life. Catzilla rose from under the Earth's crust, glowing in neon, and wreaked havoc on the east coast of the United States. That's essentially the first movie. The following eight see Cadzilla go on destructive adventures all over the world. I enjoyed my acting career for the most part. The money and the fame were great, but since I played Cadzilla in nine films, unfortunately I was typecast and I struggled to get taken seriously as an actor, just like Tom Holland. Apart from a few TV commercials for McWhisker Burger and a handful of viral YouTube videos, I struggled to find work. Then my acting career ended quite abruptly. 
I rubbed some studio execs the wrong way when they tried to feed me some store brand cat food, and I found my name on the Hollywood blacklist. I was falsely accused of harboring sympathies for Communist Party USA, and just like Vampira, Charlie Chaplin, Orson Welles, I could never find work again. Everyone thinks actors live the dream, and we do for a time. It was better during Hollywood's golden age when we would get a second windfall from DVD sales. Nowadays, with streaming services, the studios send me a quarterly royalty check for eight cents. I've even gotten negative checks before. If studio execs would take a 2% pay cut, all of our demands would be met. 2%! Anyway, I had no choice other than to take work as a beckoning cat outside Chinese restaurants. You know those cat figures with the beckoning arm? I was young and I needed the money. Interplanetary travel is risky business for the corporeally bound, but how did Gorfels come to be able to travel outside our bodies through time and space in the first place? Just like much of human prehistory, our prehistory is likewise understood through modern scientific supposition. In other words, we are just guessing. But this is what I learned in my college class on the topic. In ancient times, prior to the Gallifreyan Time War, Proto-Gorfellians were bound to anxious flesh and brittle bones. As science on our planet developed, various discoveries were made as to allow the consciousness to float outside the body and observe from feet above. Some were better able to separate from their bodies more easily than the others. They could sustain it for longer periods and travel farther from their bodies, even go on living after their flesh deteriorated. Over millennia, natural selection favored them. All Gorfels of Glamtron today can separate from their bodies at will and do so often. Concepts like time and space only affect matter. In a non-corporeal state, we are not subject to time or space. All right, so I want to show you how I'm keeping track of everything I'm doing. This is like the journal where I keep track of like my video stuff and all that. And so... Here I have the calendar and today is Monday the 23rd, or I'm sorry, Monday the 24th. And I'm going on a business trip leaving on next Sunday. So I've had to work ahead through the duration of the business trip so that I can have enough to post while I'm gone. I did have to pause the bonkers layout because I am doing the bonkers layout as well, but I didn't have time to do it. I'm not posting the bonkers ones. I'm just making them. You'll see the video next week. So that's all. Warning, this next story is a horror story. It started during my first life. I was living with two human servants named Rick and Rose. Late one fall, we took a trip to Anchorage, Alaska to see the Northern Lights, and we stayed in a nice two-story cabin outside the city. I immediately sensed that something was off. But Rick and Rose had already paid and they seemed blissfully unaware, so I decided not to say anything. More pressing than my inkling feeling was staying warm. The three of us huddled up together in bed at night. On our second night there, I was upstairs scratching things when I heard Rose call my name from downstairs. 17 Sandra Devereaux Dupree, New Mexico 6000, can you please come down here? I stuck my head out the door intending to see what she needed when I saw her peeking through the bathroom across the hall on the same floor. Don't go down there, she said. I heard it too. I ran into the bathroom to hide with them. We hid for a long time, but after we didn't hear anything, eventually we summoned the courage to come out. We grabbed all of our belongings and fled to a Motel 6. Weeks after we returned from that trip, Rose got the film developed from the disposable camera that she brought. The last photograph was of me, Rick, and Rose, huddled in the bed together, fast asleep. In my seventh life, I worked with NASA to build a research station on Mars. I trained with top catstronauts at NASA for two years. It was pretty challenging, but not that challenging. I also learned fluent Russian and Mandarin in case I would have to work with any cosmonauts or taikonauts, as well as two dialects of Martian language. 
As a space-faring non-corporeal creature from another planet, Catstronaut was a strange career choice for my seventh life. I had already seen much of time and space by that point. I did it because as a Catstronaut, I'd have a better chance of establishing a diplomatic relationship with the Martians than I'd have in my Gorful body. Unfortunately, Gorfuls of Glamtron have a bad reputation on Mars. More unfortunately, I'm afraid it's my fault. As a teenager, I was among a group of selectees who were sent to Mars as part of an exchange program. We toured a series of museums and culturally significant destinations such as Olympus Mons, Valles Marineris, the Gisero Crater, etc. During our trip to the Martian National Museum, I sneezed as workers were carefully preparing the Martian Lisa for transport. They dropped it and it was destroyed and I was blamed. Our envoy was deported back to Glamtron and all diplomatic relations ceased. Since my career as a castronaut, I've earned a second chance to re-establish relations between Glamtron and Mars. Martians inhabit the bottom of Valles Marineris, also known as the Martian Grand Canyon, although not only is it much larger than the American Grand Canyon, it is wider than North America. On landing, we knew better than to enter the canyon without Martian permission. Then I learned that Martians love salty snacks and retro vibes. They agreed to let us stay on Mars in exchange for a lifetime supply of Cheez-Its and a pallet of Elton John vinyl records. And after many weeks of appeasing them with even more Cheez-Its, they finally let us enter the canyon. Once we finally got permission, the journey inside the canyon was arduous because the weather is so cold. Also the lack of water, oxygen, and any resources of any kind whatsoever. But our Catstronaut training prepared us for all that. Negotiations with foreign governments are ultimately quite simple. All you have to do is give them everything they want. In exchange, they allowed us to stay and build our research facility on land outside the canyon, which they did not own anyway. Generally speaking, I didn't need anyone's permission or approval prior to taking over the Earth and serving as High Supreme Dictator, as there was a huge power vacuum on this planet. But there was one exception. I did have to win over the bee community. Bees tend to be very temperamental, mercurial negotiating partners. They have been known to disappear right in the middle of dinner. One gets the impression that they may have secret access to some other dimension beyond the ones we already know about, or that they may operate in and rule over the places in between dimensions. It's very conceivable that every bee that mysteriously departed this planet entered an extra-dimensional limbo zone where they were cloned many dozens of times and that they lie in wait with their army of queens, each queen with its own army of drones, for the precise predetermined moment to exact their plan and that there's nothing anybody from any planet can ever do to stop them. Anyway, prior to assuming my post, I did have to win them over with M&Ms. In order to pay for graduate school, I played piano in a speakeasy in Albuquerque. It was the kind of place you needed a password to get in. I used to know the password, but now I've forgotten it. The money I earned in the speakeasy did not pay for even one half of 1% of my graduate school tuition, but I enjoyed the gig very much. I'm legally not allowed to tell you what year this happened. I was playing the piano one night in that speakeasy when there was a knock on the door. Every customer had to knock and say the password. Tiffany, the bouncer, slid open the tiny window in the door. I couldn't see who it was, but I heard a lyrical baritone voice reciting the password. And then Tiffany, completely unfazed, opened the door for Elvis. I was but a normal looking, humble little cat playing the piano to help pay for graduate school. And on this day, I should play for Elvis Presley. He sat at the bar and enjoyed my crunchy jazz stylings and the crunchy bacon on the fool's gold loaf he ordered. After about 45 minutes, his plate was clean and I was taking a break. He approached the piano to put a tip in my jar and to my complete and utter shock, he spoke to me in my native Gorfellian language and said, which means Elvis has left the building. And then Elvis left the building.
Where I come from, our consciousness can travel and live outside the corporeal state and return to it at will. We sometimes perform mental tasks such as rote learning, calculations, negotiating, legislating, Sudoku, and the Netflix part of Netflix and Chill in our non-corporeal state. We return to our bodies to perform manual labor, make art and music, exercise, eat food, and the chill part of Netflix and Chill. Although it serves our purposes well enough, Gorful Anatomy is only temporary, with limbs and organs balanced quite precariously. For example, Gorful feet do not have any arches and rest firmly flat on the ground as they connect to a two-dimensional flat ankle. Unlike humans, Gorfuls do not grow any type of nails to paint pretty pictures on, which is kind of a shame, really. As we're creatures who can leave our bodies, most people's feet are quite nice and do not require pedicure. Although, our criminals who are sent to jail are not allowed to leave their bodies and are forced to do manual labor. In the convict community, foot treatments like pedicures are part of a booming underground black market system. All Gorfuls have three triangular eyes, a large one on the right and two small ones on the left. The large one starts out plaid at birth, and then over the course of early development it may change to paisley, houndstooth, basket weave, gingham, or honeycomb. Never polka dot though, that would be ridiculous. Mine stayed plaid. The large eye is used for seeing things far away. The two eyes on the right are always a darker and lighter shade of one color. The eyes are used for seeing things up close. The lower of the two is used for seeing objects which are lower. The higher is used to see objects which are higher. The triangular eyes are housed within a triangular eye socket and they do not move around within the head. But the head itself can move 360 degrees to achieve a full field of vision. Blinking is not necessary. When we leave our bodies, we no longer have eyes and are not able to see, but we can feel our surroundings. All right, what do we have here? This is block 74, so we need to do 75. These are all the blocks or one to 74. And I'm still making bonkers at the same time. I wanna let you in on the creative process. So I'm gonna try to talk on what I'm doing. Um, so let's do block 75, it's easy. I need to make six of them. I'm gonna treat it as a backdrop for this fabric. I found this at fabric store. I bought way more of it than what I'm gonna need, but you'll see it. I know you can't see what I'm doing right now, but you'll see it. I'm looking for some like night sky energy. This is actual night sky. So I've been making blocks now for a couple of months. And for each block, I tell another story of my character's life. And it's actually not that easy to keep coming up with new adventures every single day for a hundred days, but that is the challenge that I have put for myself. And so far, I am loving it. I am loving what I have came up with. I don't know if anyone's even reading the Instagram captions. I enjoy writing them. I get a couple of comments from people who are obviously reading them. And I, I think most people probably don't read them, but that's okay. People don't have to read things they don't want to read. But <laughs> one of the ones I'm probably the most proud of is the Western story. Just because I had this idea that I want to do a Western story. I've never written a Western story, nor do I read or watch anything Western. But I really liked what I came up with. Basically, I just thought like, okay, tropes. Let's just have some tropes. So we had like, he's the sheriff and his former partner turned bad into a criminal. And now he has to, now that damaged his reputation. So he has to go find his old partner, track him down and establish, why did you turn to your criminal activities? And what's funny is I wrote the first part because I, I did it in two parts. I wrote the first part and I had absolutely no idea what I was going to come up with for the second part. But basically, once I had all the tropes, the second part kind of became fill in the blank. All those tropes from the first part kind of ask questions, like, 
Why did he run away? Why did he become a criminal? Is he really bad? If he was really bad, why did my character trust him in the first place? Then by filling in the blanks, that's essentially how I was able to write the second half of the story. That was probably one of the ones I was most proud of. And you know what's interesting? I did a, when I was in college, I did a writing class. I don't really remember anything from the writing class except one thing, which was the readers will believe anything as long as it happens in a world where that thing would happen. So from the very beginning of writing my story, we're talking about like an alien that came from a different planet and took over a cat. And then from earlier as well, I start talking about, oh, this is Bethany. He's a raccoon optometrist from Rancho Cucamonga. And we met when we were taking helicopter lessons in Calabasas. So it's like from very early on, you pretty much know that anything and everything is possible and nothing has to make any sense. And once you establish that fact, that's when you realize you can do literally whatever you want. And it's like an equation. We, have the, we start with the block. What's the most creative way to get there? And that's when I'm like, okay, I was glamping with Barack and Michelle Obama. <laughs> or like, Dr. Jill Biden gave me strawberries and I am allergic to stri- strawberries. Just literally whatever I want. Anything can happen. Anything's possible. I wanted to write a horror story. I wanted it to be funny. I wanted it to be true and real and also fake and nonsensical science fiction. A little bit queer. Testing this microphone out. Um, The thing is, whenever I try to use microphone, whatever microphone I try to use, it usually isn't good either. So I go back to just using the iPhone microphone. If I had a producer... They could probably help me, but it's just little old me here. You know, I consider myself a quilter first rather than like a video maker. But obviously I have become a video video maker now. This is my week where I'm kind of trying to work ahead. So I need to post, I think I'm about 10 or so blocks ahead of schedule. But being only that far ahead of schedule is essentially the same as being behind schedule because there's so much to do with this project. So this is my night sky. Let me sew my night sky up. So like the best one to be the one I share on IG. I had always forged my own path in life, both on Glamtron as a Gorful and on Earth as a cat. But in my eighth life, I realized that all of my friends had coupled up and I was still single. That's when I decided that I should be able to have what everybody else has too. I asked an old college friend with a pension for matchmaking to set me up on some dates. At this point in the story, we're on my eighth life and my eighth life is a love story. It took over 80 dates before I finally found a match. I don't regret waiting until my eighth life to start dating, but when you wait that long, it kind of makes you feel like every cat you meet is the cat you've been waiting for. I had to suffer the pangs of that correction 79 times. And then I met Seven Costanza. He was a tabby that lived right down the street from me, although I never knew it and we didn't meet until the time was right. I knew it was a match right away, and even though I could never define what I was looking for, if I had to date a million other tomcats first, I would always land on Seven Costanza. Seven Costanza and I traveled the world together because I had various diplomatic missions and appointments throughout the world, and naturally, Seven Costanza came along as my first gentle cat. We found that the best way to travel was by hot air balloon. They don't travel fast, I no longer believe in rushing, we get there when we get there. And they are not very good at landing in accurate, precise locations. I no longer believe in landing in accurate, precise locations, we land where we land. Although we traveled a lot, our favorite activity was Netflix and chill sessions on my catio. We watched The Great Cat's Beat, The Cat Father Part 2, and Lion King. We also liked to climb to the top of buildings and look up at the stars. I've traveled in outer space, so I like to tell stories about the stars and the planets I've been to. Sometimes the stories were true. Seven Costanza has never left the Earth, but he likes to tell stories about his travels to other stars and planets too. 
and his stories are always true. Eventually, Seven Costanza became the only family I had, and we spent all major holidays together, like Taco Tuesday. Seven Costanza liked the soft shell with carne asada, that was his favorite, with guacamole. Me and Seven Costanza lived happily ever after, and that's the truth. It's true because time is a construct. Me and him will always be back then. It's true just like all the stories I've told are true, just like there's truth to all good fiction, and just like the universal truth that says, when the truth hurts, we lie. I was in my eighth life when I met Seven Costanza. He was in his ninth. The story of my life is mine to tell, and I choose to tell a good one with a happy ending. So as far as I'm concerned, me and Seven Costanza lived happily ever after. All right, people, we're back. And I have finished sewing all 100 blocks for the Maple and Eucalyptus quilt. I did not follow the pattern when it came to making them all eight inches or eight and a half inches, whatever it was, because the pattern called for making the block and then sewing what are essentially coping strips to make them all the same size. So I didn't do that. Instead, I just sewed the block and sometimes I sewed something beside it or something around it or I put it, I set it in something. Um, so my blocks are all different sizes, so we're not following their layout. We need to make our own layout. And I have no idea what it's going to look like because these blocks may be a little bit disjointed, but such is life. Our character led a very interesting and eclectic life, and that's what the quilt is going to look like. So one more thing I want to do is tell you the title of the quilt. The title of the quilt is going to be a Gorful's Tale, 17 Sandra Devereaux Dupree, New Mexico, 6,000 Junior, the 3rd, 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, and 9th goes west. And so I want to have the title of the quilt in the quilt top itself, like in a marquee. So I have some letter fabric, the black and white versions of the letter fabric. I can use these letters. This is a towel, but it says New Mexico on it. So I want to cut out the New Mexico I have to treat this in some way. I I'll probably have to stabilize it or I might fuse it to a foundation fabric before I sew it on because this towel material is really not stable to put in a quilt. It's also a little bit see-through. So I'll do that. I can also cut out letters of fabric too. They don't need to be printed on fabric. I can just cut them out. It just depends on what I design when I go to actually design it. Uh, I want to use this fabric. I found this fabric not too long ago. I've already used part of it in some of the blocks, but now I want to use the rest of it. So I've cut chunks out of it, but this side is untouched. Of course, I'm seeing now how it's a repeating pattern. I mean, it is a repeating pattern, but it repeats often. So it's just a black cat, just like my character. Um, but it's also a silhouette. So it could theoretically be any cat, but obviously it's my character. I, I think I want to use this as like a background to the title or for part of the title because it's a long title. Maybe just the beginning part, maybe just a Gorful's tale and then blah, 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 blah goes west. We'll see. I really don't know exactly all the details on how I'm going to design the marquee title yet. First, I'd like to get these on the design wall because that's going to show me like how much space we even have to work with, how big it's going to be. We're going to have to do some finagling to get the blocks to fit together using scrap fabric and leftovers from the blocks. And I have so much more of this cat fabric with the cat on it. I bought way more than what I was going to need. I, it's not going to work for a backing, unfortunately. It's canvas. I, I don't think it's going to feel good as a backing. Otherwise, I would put it on the back. But it's just like kind of rough canvas. It's okay for the top. And because I only use small chunks of it in each block, but I don't want to use it for the backing. Uh, so let me get these on the design wall. I'm, I have no idea how this is going to look. So let's find out together. So this is 50 of the blocks. I'm, I'm realizing that I actually do need to do the title marquee part first. Uh, 
I need to know what size it is before I figure out the layout. So um, I'm just putting them on randomly and I'll mix them around later if I feel like it or if not, whatever. They can go anywhere. There's no right or wrong place for them. So, but I'm going to go ahead and do my title situation here-ish and then I'll continue adding the other 50 blocks, which these are the other 50, okay? Tail. We need the animal tail. T-A-I-L. I need punctuation. There is no punctuation here. I did not think of that. I'm gonna have to make some punctuation marks. Let me get this together, then I'm gonna make an apostrophe. Right, so now that that's together, I need an apostrophe. I'm also gonna need some commas. And how? I don't know. I want an inch and a quarter. Can I just draw it? I need a friction pen. Where's my friction pen? All right, this is the friction pen. It's gonna erase with heat. Uh, so this Sharpie, um, I've tested this before for writing labels. It will not wash off. I don't know. It may fade over a long period of time, but I don't think it's gonna fade. Oh, geez. I should have put a sheet of paper under it. That's gonna be there forever. <laughs> That's good. And we'll clean it up when we put it on. Why did I do this? <laughs> Oh, you know what? I don't have any numbers. I don't have any numbers on my thing. No, it's only letters. I'm gonna have to, well, these are letters, so that's good, but these are numbers. So I'll have to just figure something else out. I could write 17 out. I almost feel like I wanna write 17. No, there's not enough space. There's not enough space on the quilt, otherwise I would. I'm just gonna see how this looks. I don't think I'll probably end up doing this, but what happens if I write it? You know what? It actually looks quite decent. It looks good. I think that's going to work. Tell me why I selected this blue color that's exactly the same as the background. I have to choose a different color. It's not going to show up.
All right. Uh, this is good. We're good. All right, so uh, we're going to start sewing it together, and it'll squareify. Okay, as I work on it, it will squareify. This, look at this monstrosity. What have I done? Cool, so let's just start sewing seams together. Nothing lines up. Like, how am I gonna do this? I think I need to just. Okay. This could line up with that. But it has to line up with something below it. Oh, no, it doesn't. As I entered my ninth life, I decided to spend it writing my story to leave for humanity, because it's time to go back to Glamtron. At various points in my nine lives on Earth, I enjoyed life so much that I almost forgot that I don't really belong here. I don't actually fit in on Glamtron either, and why should I? I'm amazing. Why would I fit in with people who are average? After careful thought, I've realized that after curiosity kills me for the ninth time, I will go back to Glamtron. I can't live here without Seven Costanza. But these are the nine lessons I learned throughout my time on Earth. Number one, always forge your own path in life. Number two, if you snore, get one of those machines. Number three, when you brush your teeth, scrub right through to your brain. Number four, what happens during helicopter lessons in Calabasas stays in helicopter lessons in Calabasas. One block. Number five, that dream you have about your teeth falling out is a sign that you fear losing something very important to you like teeth. Number six, when you kiss, always use too much tongue. Number seven, fall in love. Number eight, tell stories. And number nine, die old. Nine lives means nine goodbyes. The reality is I've lived through many, many more. I still think of Bethany the raccoon optometrist when I fly my helicopter through the Pennsylvania Grand Canyon. And my adventure with Nine Lives Clyde taught me that I get to write my own redemption story. Nobody else does. He probably wouldn't have gotten back together with his Tom if not for me. People still love to watch my Catzilla movies, and a new generation of Catstronauts is carrying on my work on Mars. Just like I carry a small piece of everyone I've ever met, my influence on the Earth has been far-reaching as well. So no goodbye means anybody's truly gone. I'm going back to Glamtron now. Goodbye. It's been real. Oh my gosh. I can't believe it's actually done. <laughs> All right, people, that's the quilt top finally done. I cannot believe I actually did it. Um, I already know the comments are going to say, oh, it's too busy, it's too much, you should have used stashing to calm it down. No, I shouldn't have. It's fine the way it is. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to use this 
batting, this is fusible, 80-20. And then this is a, this is a flannel backing. Flannel. This assignment that I gave myself to come up with a story every day for 100 days has fully pushed the limits of my creativity to new depths and I'm so proud of what I've been able to accomplish here. The blocks and the whole story are going to stay up on Instagram so I have a record of it and this is the final result. I had an absolute blast making this quilt. I hope you enjoyed this video and that's gonna be all for today. Thank you for coming to Dave's Craft Room. Like and subscribe to my channel and please come again.